mother, mother As far too many of you crying Oh, brother, brother, brother As far too many of you dying Which way are you going? And which side will you be on? Will you stand and watch while All the seeds of hate are sown? Will you stand with those who say Let his will be done With one hand on the Bible And one hand on the gun One hand on the Bible And one hand on the gun Which way are you looking? Is it hard to see? Say what's wrong for him is now wrong for me. Lines have changed, we've rearranged, and what have we become? All the olive branches turn to spears, and the flowers turn to stone. All the olive branches turn to spears. And the flowers turn to stone So now you turned your back on All the things you used to preach And now it's Let him live in freedom Well only if he lives like me You walk the streets of righteousness but you refuse to understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man I don't understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above? the fear can we learn to see the need can we share humanity or oh, I can see another day come broken people can we be made whole can we be made whole can we be made whole as we Love is breaking us, love remaking us. Good morning, Good Shepherd. Would you join me in this call to worship? Creator God, call us all. You declared, O Lord, that our sons and daughters would prophesy. The young will see visions, while the elders dream dreams. Call us to truth. Resurrected Christ, guide us all. You have told us, great God, what is required. Love you, Lord, with all our hearts. Love our neighbors as ourselves. Holy, holy, holy spirit. Move us to action. So that justice rolls like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Lord, have mercy. We offer ourselves, our words, our songs, our pain, our hands and our feet to you, our God. Amen. Good morning, church, and happy Trinity Sunday. This Sunday, we celebrate who God is, the God of love, creator, son, and Holy Spirit. 
that somehow through this being of relationship, we experience all of life. And when we sing songs about the Trinity, um, sometimes it's confusing because we can't fully grasp what that means. And so we use allegory and metaphor. And this morning we're gonna sing a song that to me um, uses those things to tap into the sense of wonder of this God, this creator, son and Holy Spirit.
from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is my, mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a sickness here that threatens to divide us And we're all afraid to say its name out loud Lord, I know that you can heal us of this virus So we need you, we need you right now There's a darkness here that's dangerous and aggressive It's getting harder every day to shake its power But Lord, I know that you can free us from oppression so we need you, we need you right now Cause we don't know what to do So we'll turn our eyes to you And we've run out of words to say But if you come and have your way You can save us from ourselves Before our wounds hurt someone else we Does it mean to have compassion for another? How can I claim the love of God that I can't see? If I can find the will to harm and kill my brother Cause he neglected to look like me And I can speak the words of men and songs of angels I can give all my possessions to the poor But if your love can't move the mountains of my hatred Somehow I missed you and I need you so much more Cause I don't know what to do So I'll turn my eyes to you And I've run out of words to say You can come and have your way Would you save me from myself Before my wounds hurt someone else
better. We need you now. We need you now. Lord, we need you. All are welcome at the table of God, every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all, tearing down every hostile wall so that the many may become one. One heart, one family, one new humanity. For God, who is love, and Christ, who is all and in all, show no partiality and makes no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality can count for or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos, over our hatred, and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. To set us ablaze, to forgive and to reconcile. For all are welcome to the table of God. Every man, woman, and child.
This morning, let us continue our worship through our generosity liturgy. Let's say this together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord, devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May it be true of our community. Amen. Well, at this time, we say a prayer to one another, and this prayer is simply grace and peace to you this morning. So if you have someone around you right now, your family or a roommate, speak grace and peace. If you don't and you're by yourself, know this, you're not alone. Um, we love you and we send grace and peace to you now. Why don't you send grace and peace to a loved one? Grace and peace. And now a reading from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. That the gospel of our Lord praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now, having heard our gospel text, we take a moment of quiet to open our hearts, to reflect, and to sort of pay attention and show up to the moment. And whatever we bring to this moment, whether it's lots of faith or lots of doubt, we simply invite you to bring your full self. And in the quiet of this moment, let's ask God to connect this story to our story and the challenges that we face together in this world. And now let us pray. God, open our hearts that we would see, that we would hear, and that we'd have courage and faith in this moment. Amen. After I expressed my personal disgust for the president's actions earlier this week, when he walked someone else's Bible through a crowd parted by force, he stood in front of someone else's church to pose hollowly on the heels of threats, threats of domination and military action. I was asked an inflammatory question. Are you even a Christian? Now, of course, I'm not sure how you would respond to a question like that, but I'd like you to consider it today. You know, in my mind, my immediate response was different than it would have been, say, 10 years ago, where I would have flippantly and confidently 
flaunted my sort of secure status as Christian. But instead, in the quiet of the moment where I read those words, I simply thought in the inner sanctum of my heart, I hope that I am. Former slave Linda Brent, she also was known as Harriet Jacobs, she had her hopes stirred. She thought that her mother's service as a faithful slave to the mistress would guarantee that her mistress would free Linda in her will upon the mistress's death. But instead, tragically, the mistress bequeathed Linda to the mistress's five-year-old niece. Linda recognized in that moment what we're all recognizing, that you cannot teach the golden rule without first practicing the golden rule. She courageously rejected and wrote about the hypocrisy and the dissonance and the disconnect between what her slave mistress taught her and how she treated her. Now, this is Brent's response to the specific injustice within the larger atrocity of slavery. She says, quote, so vanished our hopes. My mistress had taught me the precepts of God's word that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And whatsoever you would uh, a man do unto you, do unto them. But I was her slave. And I suppose that she did not recognize me as her neighbor, end quote. Today is Trinity Sunday, and we look at a text that's iconically labeled uh, in the 19th century as the Great Commission. And now, as we face this cherished text together, as if we needed any more impetus, this moment is forcing us to consider the great sickness of American spirituality, which in turn is forcing many of us to rethink exactly where we are and how we arrived here. But instead of doubling down on our previous understandings, which is what frightened humans do, I urge us to embrace the disorientation. I invite us this morning to interrogate our previous understandings, including understandings of the so-called Great Commission. And to do this work, I think we have to take a hard look in the mirror at what Dallas Willard called the great omission of American Christian spirituality. And to do this work, I'm going to enlist the help of womanist theologian, Dr. Mitzi J. Smith. She's brilliant. Dr. Smith reminds us that this text's iconic naming as the Great Commission happened around the same time that Linda Brent, as a slave, was experiencing the devastating reality of American Christian hypocrisy. This title, Great Commission, was popularized by famous missionaries like Hudson Taylor or William Carey. It became the focal point it became the filter for measuring success in the British and in the American churches. And it's a legacy that we continue to experience today. But a great omission was made. An omission that people perhaps at the time couldn't see because their imaginations were laced with colonial instincts and visions. And Jesus' so-called Great Commission was interpreted in terms of colonialism. It was a divine mandate to go to a pagan nation or nations to teach them and to convert them. And one can see why they would come to this conclusion. You know, the imperial language of Rome, after all, was adopted in the commission itself. Listen in. Jesus says, uh, beginning with the language of power, all authority has been given to me. And then we get the scope of the mission. He says they're to go to all the nations or the peoples of the earth. And what's the job? Well, it's framed as teaching them to obey. Now, this imperial echo has led many interpreters to think that maybe Matthew was corrupted by the imperial context, and maybe this Great Commission has no helpful use in a world like ours. But Dr. Mitzi Smith believes otherwise, and so do I. Yes, imperial language is used here, and it's led to so many abuses and misunderstandings in every age where that imperial spirit is present. It happened with the Holy Roman Empire when it was abused through the Crusades. It happened after Christianity's center relocated to Western Europe, where it became entangled with Western, I mean, Western royal politics. And it was abused in the colonial expansion, you know, the three centuries of Spanish Inquisition. It was the so-called Age of Exploration, which I think David Bailey rightly calls the Age of Exploitation. It was abused in the transatlantic slave trade and the vanquishing of indigenous peoples in the Americas. And that imperial spirit continues to show up in the present moment where Christians have significantly conflated uh, Christianity with supremacies of all kind, state, race, gender, sexuality, you name it. And it makes possible the actions of our president 
where he threatens to take military action on his own people. And he promises a dominating response to the rowdy. And then he attaches it to the Bible and the church. And a large portion of Christian America citizenry applauds. But what if Matthew never intended Jesus to be read this way? What if we've omitted the very thing that makes the commission of Jesus powerful and good? You know, what if the human problem of supremacy, you know, rooted in that primal story of Cain and Abel, extending through history, you know, taking our imperial ideas of authority as domination and purpose as turning them into us, you know, what if that human problem has persisted through the ages and continues to override the original intent of these last words of Jesus. We've taken Jesus' words. We've made them something else. We turned authority into social hierarchy and association with the right chain of command. We turned making disciples into simply teaching or exporting content and exporting beliefs to people who don't believe or agree with them. And rather than a loving invitation, We've defined this as a sovereign command to be obeyed no matter what, how ready we are or how awkward it may be. But I'd like to ask, what if the methods and the messages that people have taken abroad under the name of good news can only be truly restored to the status of good when we have the courage to listen, to listen to the witness of the people and the communities who've suffered the consequences of this great omission? I believe that we must learn to hear the critical voice crying to us in the American wilderness, that we can only begin and that we must begin to repent and to rediscover with their help what the good news of Jesus Christ really is. Dr. Smith invites us to let Matthew speak to us about authority, not empire. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, his main body of teaching, it's said of him that he taught as one who had authority, not as the scribes. And just before this, he had concluded with this big triple emphasis, the importance of practice, of tangibly embodying God's will in our life. The authority granted to Jesus is the one based on a lived life. And in the words of Dr. Smith, it's based on a dynamic, quote, organic ministry characterized by congruity between his acts of justice and the words he spoke. It's this congruity that is the great omission of America. We have divorced words and deeds, ideas and behavior, just faith and just practice. And Matthew sets the sage to show us that authority is the integration of the two. You know, the level of impatience and disgust and outrage or even cynicism among our black brothers and sisters toward white Christians right now is aimed at the omission of congruity, at a great disconnect between the love and the faith that we talk about and the way we connect that to the tangible suffering of their community. It's aimed at a spirituality of optics that, like the spirituality of the scribes and the Pharisees, who Jesus critiqued vehemently, cleans the outside of the cup while neglecting the stain on the inside. And so Dr. Smith helps us see that this authority isn't rooted in imperial ideas of hierarchy or domination or extension, but rather the authority Jesus is talking about is the result of a beautiful combination of just practice and just words. And the authority that he gives his disciples to teach all uh, to teach is all about continuation. Jesus asks us to take on his authority, to live in that authority, which comes from the interplay, the marriage between words and deeds, without which there is no participation in the kingdom of heaven. It's no coincidence that Jesus doesn't begin his ministry before he has shown that he will not abuse his power or the authority that God's entrusted him. You know, I consider my own ministry experience. And even evangelical church has often failed to follow Jesus' pattern here when it comes to promoting people into positions of power and authority. The church has often valued charismatic leadership, dynamic personalities, gifted public speakers, and too quickly, it immerses them in positions of leadership. I think that we've been seeing the fallout of this in America. Now, I consider my and my wife's first experiences was trying to practice this so-called Great Commission. Now, we were both part of church groups, white kids from the American South, sent to the housing projects in Chicago and to the indigenous peoples in Nevada, with very little lived experience of the Jesus way and very little understanding of Jesus' actual teaching. 
We were sent with prepackaged summaries of a, a thinned out gospel that excluded most of what Jesus emphasized when he talked about the good news, like the emphasis on relief for the poor, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed, etc. And we went to tell them that they needed to repent, that they needed to convert. These are the consequences of the great omission of making Jesus' last words about extending a message and making converts, usually by whatever means is necessary, and neglecting that sort of congruity that Jesus' authority is rooted in. We have to learn the lesson that we can't export what we don't possess. And unfortunately, the white-dominated American church has doubled down with echoes of colonial mandates on exporting a faith that's often not been willing to consistently integrate with just, just words and just practice. And the church and the world suffer as a result. This is why we need to recover the priority of practice. It takes nothing away from what we've classically called faith. In fact, the Bible often frames faith as incomplete, as insufficient, if it isn't accompanied by practice. Practice is the telos of our faith. And the practice of love and justice is its crown. Yes, we should always be striving to keep the heart open to God and open to ourselves and open to our neighbors. But at the same time, we need to get to work. And Jesus constantly asked us to interrogate the fruit of our lives and of our world, to look at the outcomes. And if we discover bad fruit, we must conclude there's a rotten root. And so to come into contact with this rotten root, a rotten fruit, for this to lead us into an honest and an intense interrogation of the root, that's the work of discipleship. This is the integration that produces authority. This is the integration that's worth reproducing in the world, not as a sovereign command, but as a loving invitation from our creator. The great tragedy is that the white American church's understanding of the Great Commission has rarely slowed or stifled the presence and the participation in white supremacy. And in many cases, it's actually extended, exported, and justified it. And so we do well with our womenist theologians to interrogate this teaching afresh, to get back to its founding idea, to recover what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to have true authority which comes from integration, what it means to bear witness to something beyond us in ways that aren't violent, that aren't dominating, but are rather dignifying and enriching. It's time to get beyond an understanding of Jesus' mission as teaching people how to join our religious and cultural team and instead recover this mission as rooted in the authority of integration of just words and just deeds, flowing out as an invitation to a lifestyle of love and of justice. Jesus didn't say, teach them right ideas. He said, teach them how to practice what I've taught. And what did Jesus teach? Yet today we need to recover the command as the command of love. We need to recover the vision for this love in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, with its blessed poor and its blessed meek and its blessed peacemakers, with its reconciling worshipers who take responsibility and they make restitution, with its loving of enemies. We need to recover this example of love in Jesus' life that listens to the outsiders and their cries, like the example of the Syrophoenician woman whose persistent cries reach Jesus' ears. And in Matthew's story, Jesus learns and he shifts as a result. Jesus, as God with us, isn't above being taught or challenged because that's what love looks like. And we need to recover the example of holding tensions at the same table, that could have a place for a tax collector who was an accomplice to the empire and a zealot who was violently trying to take that empire down. We need to make this love tangible and we need to embody it like Jesus did. And that's our church's mission after all, to embody the love of Christ for the good of our neighbor. Now, what does that mean right now? Cassandra Overton Welchin, who is the co-founder and director of Mississippi Women's Economic Security Initiative, was asked this question on a webinar hosted by our partner Telos this week. She said, I don't want your hugs, basically, I'm paraphrasing. I don't want the words that you would offer that feel hollow when you've experienced loss. She said, if love is wanting and doing what's best for another person or another group, then we should do something about this. She said she, she looks at the wage gap in Mississippi, 
which is wider than any other state because of the legislation. And then she thinks about how black women bear the brunt of that wage gap. And then she thinks of the churches where you have governors and legislators sitting in pews. And what are they hearing from their pastors and their spiritual leaders? What if they were called upon in the name of Jesus to just practice the way Jesus did to people like Zacchaeus or the rich young ruler or the scribes and the Pharisees? What if we emphasized not just interpersonal love, but public love? And in the words of Cornell West, justice is simply what love looks like in public. And love always begins with listening. You know, too often people have an idea of what is best for someone, uh, but they haven't asked whether that person thinks it's best for them. And so we fall into savior traps. And as the Reverend Al Sharpton said at George Floyd's funeral, and I paraphrase, we don't need a white savior. We just need you to get your knee off our neck. Paul Tillich says, the first act of love is to listen. We can't skip that step. In order to know what is just in a person-to-person encounter, Paul Tillich says, quote, love listens. It is its first task to listen. No human relation, especially no intimate one, is possible without mutual listening. Reproaches, reactions, defenses may be justified in terms of proportional justice, but perhaps they would prove to be unjust if there were more mutual listening. All things, and all men, so to speak, call on us with small or loud voices. They want us to listen. They want us to understand their intrinsic claims, their justice of being. They want justice from us. But we can give it to them only through the love which listens. End quote. Now's the time to listen. It's a time to embrace the dissonance, to not let our previous understandings explain away or categorize everything that's unfolding in this American chaos. No, Matthew talks about the justice of God with us. And from the beginning, Jesus is called Emmanuel until the end where Jesus says, my presence will be with you always. And we need that presence. We need receptive hearts that will explode in a moment of love and justice that produces an authority that doesn't come overnight, but through practice and through self-interrogation. It produces more and more people that put Jesus' words into practice. That's the work. So let's do the work. Amen. And now, would you join me in the Apostles' Creed? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, having declared our faith, we offer our prayers to God, the cries of our heart right now, the tensions of our heart, And these are the prayers of the people. They're prayers that come and rise from the hearts and the imaginations and the angst of our real people. And so let's join together in the tension of these prayers. God of mercy, we come to you this week with heavy hearts. For some of us, it is even too great to bear. We cry out to the spirit and ask for her to hover over the land and to bring order where there's chaos, healing where there is pain and change where there is injustice. Create in us hearts that are committed to your will, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, we ask that you would forgive white Americans for our collective sins. Forgive us for our silence. Forgive us for the ways we said nothing and the ways that we did nothing while our brothers and sisters of color suffered. Forgive us for the ways that we have ignored the tears of black mothers, for the ways we have ignored the groans of black fathers. Year after year after year, they have cried out and we have done little. Forgive us for allowing generations of black bodies to be crushed and choked and imprisoned. 
Forgive us for the blood that has been shed on our streets. Forgive us from, for the ways that we have benefited from and that we have been complicit within a racist system. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for our city. We are at the epicenter of a pandemic, and now we have a, a fight for justice in our midst, a fight that's breaking out all over our country. We pray for the daily protests here, that you would protect the protesters from police brutality and aggression. And we pray for our police, that they'd be protected from violent actors in the midst of our protest. We pray for the small business owners, the bodegas, the restaurants, who on top of economic hardship are now facing the destruction of their stores. But most important, we pray for what this protest is all about, the systematic destruction of black bodies and lives. We pray for justice to be served, for reform to take place in our laws and in our hearts on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, as followers of Jesus, we are not strangers to remembering death. And so we say their names. Brianna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery. Eric Garner. Philando Castile. Trayvon Martin. Sandra Bland. George Floyd. We cannot name them all. There have been too many, but you know each one by name. O oh Lord, we ask that their names would never be forgotten, that their pain would never be forgotten, that the injustice of their deaths would never be forgotten. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for our leaders today at the local, state, and national level. We pray for Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo that they would put an end to the police brutality that's flooding our phones, that they would enact fair and just laws to protect all of our citizens. We also pray for President Trump, that he would stop using his words and position to deepen divisions in America, that he would stop fueling hatred. We pray that you could do what only you could do and bring healing to our nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now having offered our prayers, we take a moment to confess our sins. Now this is not just morbid introspection or a cosmic beatdown, right? The point of this is to take responsibility in love, not under the harsh uh, glare or glance of our creator who's just looking for us to stumble in order to, you know, snuff us out. Uh, the image that we get from the Bible and through the lens of Jesus is that it is the kindness of God, the love and patience of God that leads us to meaningful change. And so it's in that environment, it's imagining God all around us, wooing us, inviting us, and, and moving us toward change, moving us toward love. That's the premise of confession. So would you join me? in a moment, a quiet moment of reflection as we think about the week behind us, personal and corporate sins. Let's take a moment to reflect and to repent. And whatever comes to your mind, just simply hold it before God, knowing that you are loved, knowing that you're forgiven. Hold it there and begin to imagine how God would guide you to change, how God would guide you to make amends, how God would guide you to repent. And as we consider these things, we remember we're not alone. And so would you join me in this corporate confession? Most merciful God, we have confessed that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now friends, receive the good news of Jesus Christ, that you are loved and that you are welcomed as you are. As the scripture says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward us. 
And as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. You are loved and forgiven. Amen. And now, let's take a moment to, as we come to this table, to lift our hearts in gratitude. That's what communion uh, means, essentially. That's what Eucharist means. That's what this table represents. Gratitude and connection, communion. And so let this be a gesture of our movement toward God, our movement toward our fellow brother and sister in this world, and even toward our enemy. The psalm says you make a, a, a table, you set a table in the presence of my enemies. And so we come to this table with that in mind. Would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Lord, you are beautiful and holy. And when we think of what we see in the life and in the death of Jesus Christ, we marvel at how you turn authority, the authority of empires and egos into something altogether different. You put it on display through your life and through your death. And so we pray now that you would inscribe that in our hearts as we come to this table. This body broken and this blood spilled, it would become our way. And we pray that by the power of your spirit and according to your word, that the bread and cup that we each hold with us now would become to us and for us the body and blood of Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you risen Christ. We thank you for this body, which is broken and given for the world. We pray that we ourselves would know that brokenness afresh and that we would know what it means to be given for the good of another. Amen. And likewise, Jesus took the cup and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you risen Christ. We thank you for this blood which speaks a better word than the blood that's being shed right now on our streets. We pray that you would heal our violence, that you would heal our pain, that you would help us to make restitution and reconcile. We do this in the name of your blood, inspired by it, receiving the gift of this blood and this love, which the blood symbolizes afresh. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now, friends, as you're at home, we invite you to receive the bread and the cup. Our practice is intinction, where you take the bread and you simply dip it in the cup, and you say, thanks be to God. And so now, as we remember the broken body of Christ, we receive Holy Communion. Thanks be to God. Friends, I know this has been a very difficult week. Uh, it's been a week that has pressed in on all of us, but especially on our black brothers and sisters. And so we just want to say that we are here, that we are with you as you want to grieve and process or vent. Uh, myself, David, Kate, Kindy, our elders are available. Uh, and we'd love to serve and to listen and to be of any assistance that feels like good news and that feels like love right now. Uh, we encourage you not to waste this moment, but to seize it, to do the reflection, to do the work. Uh, we've posted resources on our website. Uh, you can follow a lot of our elders and, and our pastors on social media. You can see the things that they're doing and the things that they're advocating if you're looking to learn and grow in this moment. But most of all, we want those of you in our community, uh, our black brothers and sisters who feel the brunt of this, to know that we care and that we're here with you and that we're going to do our best to make this right. Now receive this benediction. Live today's day. God gives it to you. It belongs to you. Live it in God. 
Tomorrow's day belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. Do not impose today's worry upon tomorrow. Tomorrow belongs to God. Hand it over to him. The present moment is a frail footbridge. If you weigh it down with yesterday's regrets, tomorrow's anxieties, the footbridge gives way and you lose your footing. The past, God forgives it. The future, God gives it. Live today's day in communion with God. Amen. Go in peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Oh.